Hi, Hi Rachel. Hey, great to meet you, Jenna. Great to meet you too. Great to have you here today. Um, so I would love to get this kicked off by just having you tell us a little bit about um, Multiverse and your role there and give us a brief introduction. Great. I'm just going to pop that filter off because for whatever reason, it was appearing backwards on the screen. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm Rachel. I'm the VP of marketing here at Multiverse. Um, I've been here just under a year um, and I've spent my career in technology. Um, previously was at LinkedIn um, and I'm excited to really share today, like how I'm thinking about brand strategy at Multiverse and how I think about leadership here too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, and what do you guys do there at Multiverse for people who are watching that aren't familiar with the brand? That's a great question. Um, Multiverse really aims to build a diverse set of future leaders through apprenticeships. We really have a belief that the education system today doesn't adequately prepare individuals to start their career or advance their career. Uh, a single shot of learning um, in that sort of three or four year period, whether you're in the US or the UK, um, isn't what you need to develop the technical and durable skills you'll need throughout your career. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So can you talk about um, what is one trend technology or opportunity you are following and excited about for the future and would like to learn more about? Great question. Um, I've never been a big trends person. I think new channels emerge all the time. And the most successful brands have a pretty clear understanding of their positioning and message and how that adapts to new channels. Think of like a couple of years ago, right? No brand was on TikTok. Um, and the most successful brands understand like what that channel is and how their positioning and messaging will show up on that channel. And it hasn't ultimately a channel shouldn't change the strategy of a brand. A brand strategy evolves over time in consideration of new channel sets available. When I do think about trends, I was just looking at Snap. They've just reforecasted um, for this quarter. Um, and they've done that because the economic climate declining faster than they expected. I mean, for Snap, the economic climate means ad revenue. Um, and so Snap is expecting advertisers to spend much less in this year ahead. And they're expecting us to spend much less because they're expecting us to have smaller budgets because they're expecting our company's revenue to decline. Um, and so when I think about the year ahead for marketers, I really think the really clear strategy, the really clear understanding of your return on investment, um, and the really clear understanding of how the value your brand is bringing to that return on investment and will be critical. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, can you talk about your approach to leadership and how your leadership has evolved over the years? Uh, yeah, great question. You know, leadership is, I feel like it's an interesting question, right? We're really just here all um, helping people through their careers. Um, and if you're fortunate enough to be a people manager and a leader, that's an enormous privilege. Um, when I think about it, I think people want a place where they can learn and a place where they can feel psychologically safe doing it. Um, and so I try my hardest to create that environment. I try to give people stretch opportunities um, and when they occasionally fail, I try to be there to be that safety net for them. I think that management style is a little bit harder earlier in your career because at this point in my career, I'm fortunate to have the social capital and experience, A, to give people that freedom to learn um, and B, to know that I can probably fix it. Um, and I think early in your career, it's a little bit harder to sort of give out so much autonomy to your team. Um, but I do think that's when you get the best work is when effectively, you know, my growth leader, like for our B2C team or my growth leader for our B2B team, they truly, you know, run their own departments um, incredibly. Um, and I'm really here to make sure that our strategy sits together um, and that they have what they need to be excellent. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, I'm curious, since you are actually in the business of helping people um, find their careers, be it through um, at Multiverse, through, you know, internships and whatnot, and then um, at LinkedIn previously, these connections, how does that help you think about and phrase um, your approach to, you know, cultivating leadership in the community? Yeah, I mean, I think I've always, I think when I think about what attracted me to LinkedIn and Multiverse, I really care about marketing for missions I believe in. And I think getting um, equitable access to opportunity and equitable development throughout your career uh, isn't like, and just an incredibly pressing issue for our time. Um, and so how do I think that influences how I manage? I think 
it means I'm very conscious of where everyone's starting point is. Uh, I really measure the distance traveled. So everyone did not start at the same place, um, you know, in their life, in their career. Um, and so when I think about what someone's achieved, especially when I'm looking at a resume, I look to understand where the starting point was. Um, and then that's something we do when we hire at Multiverse. And it's absolutely something we do in our admissions team. We think about apprentices. Our uh, apprentices, we're absolutely ensuring we're assessing for potential, not pedigree. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, can you talk about what drew you to marketing early in your career and then what intrigues you about marketing today? I think early in my career, I just knew I really liked people. Um, and I think that led to an interest in consumer behavior. Um, in the UK, we do these things called A-levels and I did one in psychology and I realized uh, that, you know, I, I was sort of deeply interested in human motivation. Um, and so that's sort of how I ended up in a career marketing. My first job is in public relations. I then moved to what was called digital marketing. Then I don't think we'd call it that now. I think we'd call it growth marketing. Um, and um, what sort of motivates me today, I'd say it, it really is like I, I've changed from being motivated by all human behavior to being motivated by like equitable, like it's a change from motivation in all human behavior to a motivation in equitable access. Um, and, and what equality means actually, not just in access to jobs, but in how we market. We have, uh, words are very powerful. Um, and we have an enormous responsibility as marketers uh, to think about how do our teams represent the communities we're talking about? Um, and how do we make sure the words we're using are helping advance how people think about critical um, topics and issues. Um, yeah, and so, and so that's what motivates me today. It's um, making sure that I'm, we're part of changing, uh, you know, assumptions that are made. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of some work you've done that supports that mission? Yeah, great. Um, I mean, here at Multiverse, we're kind of lucky to get to do that every day. Um, uh, we really think a lot about, you know, so one of our challenges of our category, right, is the word apprentice is up in people's minds, something quite specific. Um, in the UK, uh, it's changed quite a lot in the UK, but I think in the UK, it's still like seen as, you know, not as good as university at times. Um, and in the US, it's just, oh, I, yeah, I know that. They, those happen in Europe, right? Um, I hear in Germany, they're excellent for auto manufacturers. Um, and I think our job over the past several years has been to change what it means to be an apprentice. An apprentice is something incredibly aspirational. Like what could be a better outcome than spending several years at an organization? In the, it's between 12 and 15 months in the US and one and three years in the UK, depending on the program you pick. Um, graduating with no, like graduating your apprenticeship with a qualification, no college or university debt, an incredible experience on your resume at companies like American Express, Google, Cisco, Barclays, you know, and I know how talented our apprentices are because they sit on my team. <laughs> um, and so I really, um, yeah, I really do think that like, when I think about how we advance what like society thinks, I think it's about like, what is that yardstick on a resume? Too often people say, oh, Oxford, oh, Cambridge, oh, Stanford, like they must be smart. And we know those snap judgments happen every day, probably in many organizations of the listeners today. Um, and the only way to change those snap judgments is to give someone an alternative, something they can quickly look at and say, oh yes, that also means incredible. Um, and an alternative to a very like high profile university is a high profile apprenticeship. And we're here to deliver a high profile apprenticeship to change who has access to those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about what some of those apprenticeships might be in, for example, which fields and, and you mentioned such big brands like American Express and Google and Cisco. So what does an apprenticeship look like from at your client, some of your clients? Great question. Um, so at American Express, um, our apprentices actually are in software engineering. 
Um, and so that is a co very common program um, that many of our apprentices go into. Our American Express apprentices, I think, are at seventy thousand dollars. So these are highly these are highly paid jobs. Um, we're not like here to deliver an unpaid internship. We're here to deliver like meaningful salaries with meaningful uh, salary trajectory. Um, and so our software engineering apprenticeships uh, are like. 12, 15 months long, and the individuals spend 12, 12 weeks getting to grips with the basics, you know, and then they're into the job. Um, and it is 80% of the time delivering real code shipped to real features, um, and 20% of the time developing your skills. Um, and that applies to software engineering and also applies to marketing. Our marketing apprenticeship, we have marketing apprentices at WPP, at Omnicom, um, and I can speak to our marketing apprentices because I'm so fortunate to have two on my team. Our TikTok channel, our social media is our top source of apprentice supplies. Our TikTok channel is run by Yasmin, Yasmin's 19. She's one of our incredible apprentices and she's so good at it because she does not have to imagine what the persona of a 19 year old is. Mm -hmm. Yasmin is uh, our target audience. Um, she deeply resonates with our target audience. And most importantly, she's deeply committed to being successful in her role because she, there's no cause she cares more about than the journey that we're on. Um, so yeah, software engineering, marketing, uh, data, uh, those are like a key, like key three. And then we have one called uh, Digital Business Accelerator. Um, and that's really focused on um, rounding out a sort of broad skill set, like you might think of for an MBA, but instead these are all available for 16 to 24 year olds in the UK and 18 to 26 year olds in the US. And then those similar skill sets are also available to people for later in their careers who want to upskill. So you or I, Diana, you know, we may take, um, we could take a data, we could take a, a data apprenticeship at this point in our career. Um, we could change our data abilities from being able to do a pivot table in Excel to being able to query a database. Um, and actually for marketers, I do think as our data acumen needs to advance and improve, like I'd actually see many marketers benefiting from that in the future. Excellent, amazing. Um, so can you tell me, going back to your own career, um, what traits that you possess that has made you a successful marketer and how do you nurture that? Mm. I'd say I, I love to know what's going on <laughs> in other departments. <laughs> I just love to know what's going on in all aspects of my life. Um, and I think when you get to leadership, your job is to understand what every department is doing in the business understand the impact that department's decisions might have on your work. For example, if engineering is going to, you know, if engineering has an enormous list of priorities and maybe marketing's like pixels aren't going to get added or the changes we need to the acquisition flow aren't going to happen. It's really important that you understand that you understand what has made it above their priority list and you can make the justification and business case for why, you know, your project will deliver more business return than the ones above the line. But if you're not able to speak to the VP of engineering, you're not able to understand those other priorities on their list and you're not able to sort of build that business case and have that discussion, you're not going to have a seat at the strategic table. And, and most importantly, you're not going to be able to advocate for the best things for the business that you work at. Um, and so when I think about what has like made me successful, I guess it's I've always taken the stretch project. Every time a project comes up that is it really marketing? When I was an IC, I would take every project that wasn't really marketing because I just wanted to know like, uh, I remember doing like an internal consulting project at LinkedIn where I had to reorg a 4,000 person sales team, nothing to do with marketing, but I took it because I now know how to reorg a 4,000 person sales team. And that is an opportunity that comes up so rarely in your career that I understand deeply how every process in sales works because I had to remap every salesperson from the job they were in to the job they were going to and their skill and knowledge gaps. So because I've done that, I know the skill and knowledge so many flavors of salespeople need that when I'm training them on how to sell a new product from marketing, it feels like a piece of cake. Right. That's amazing. I love that example. Um, can you talk about other experiences you've had that have, you feel have helped prepare you for the leadership role that you're in today? I think I've been really fortunate with international opportunities. Um, if you were watching this in the UK, I mean, few brands there are plenty of examples but most brands have to look out of the UK to grow to be big enough um, and so they'll look to Europe to expand or they'll look to the US to expand multiverse operates in the US and the UK I'm here in New York today um, and so because of that marketers who have experience in Europe 
or in Asia or in the US will be more valuable. Um, and I have had the opportunity to live and work in the US for a decade, um, in Beijing for two years, and in London, actually the least time, I think five years maybe, <laughs> but I am originally British. Um, um, and I think that has a given me the authority to be able to speak um, on international marketing strategies, and B, made me deeply empathetic. Uh, you, it, you really do, uh, by, you know, live, uh, any, and most, uh, many people who've even, you know, taken vacations, you do uh, by spending time in other cultures and other experiences. I think it just makes you reflect more on your own personal experiences. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, that's so true. Um, do you think that that show, how does that show up in your marketing when you're marketing to say consumers in the U S versus consumers in the UK or Europe, how do you shift to adapt to the culture? Yeah. I mean, I'd say for us, um, on our B2B side, you know, we, most of our organizations we're working with are global organizations, um, who do think about, uh, their people like acquisition and people development strategies in like somewhat similar ways globally. Um, on our B2C side, so how we work with apprentices, uh, it is it, there are some sort of pretty meaningful differences in terms of the age groups we work with. In the UK, you can finish school at 16. In the US, it's 18. Um, and also, I mean, when we think about what it means to have equitable access, um, the demographics, you know, that you want to make sure are represented are, are different in the UK and the US. Like what is uh, representation in the UK and the US is, a, is different because those populations look different. Um, and I also think the conversation around DEI is, is 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 rightly different in those two countries. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I I think it does show up in our marketing, um, like from as straightforward as vocabulary and targeting to as complex as uh, what are the issues we want to take a proactive and forward leaning start, stance on externally, you know. We obviously many organizations have had discussions around what are we going to say on the abolishment of Roe v. Wade? Like, what does that mean to the communities that we support? Uh, like, you know, uh, the horrific shooting that happened yesterday in the US and the like, even, like the Buffalo shooting last week. We constantly think about like as a company that uh, represents, uh, you know, individuals who are trying to get equitable access to opportunity. Like, how do these, like, very challenging and horrific acts happening in the U.S. right now um, degrade that ability um, or potential of opportunity for, for individuals? And so I think that means that we have really different conversations about what do we need to be as a brand in those two markets. That makes a lot of sense. Um, can you talk about how consumer behavior is um, informing your work and what is new and shifting that is changing it? Yes, I mean, I, um, Scott Galloway actually posted an article last week. Um, it, it was sort of looking at changing consumer trends and Netflix, I think last year was watched for 9.6 trillion minutes. TikTok was watched for 22 trillion. Um, and so social media is our top sort of channel for reaching young adults as apprentices. Um, and so when we say social media, we mean TikTok and Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, and our Instagram videos get much more reach than TikTok. Uh, sorry, wrong way around. Our TikTok videos get much more reach than our Instagram videos. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we don't find Instagram to be incredibly valuable. Um, but what I will say is uh, how right now uh, for brands looking to reach young adults, I, I think, you know, TikTok is an, is an incredible avenue to meet them where they are. Um, and I know some have been like potentially a little uh, more cautious to adopt just because like, you know, the trending sounds, the need to like, you know, move quickly on new videos and um, and it is user generated content and user generated content is what does best there. Um, and I guess I just share that like, we've really approached that by our, we have our apprentices come for content days um, and all of our, you know, many of our marketing apprentices and all of our different apprentices come um, and they want to contribute to our content. Um, and so we do like fun days, we do lunch, obviously we, you know, compensate them for their travel and their time. Um, and we all come together uh, to like make different TikToks each month. And we create this big bank of content um, that allows us to then like share the story of our apprentices throughout the month. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think for brands looking to reach young adults, like 
just with where that channel is right now in terms of reach um, and resonance, it, it's just super important to be there. Absolutely. Can you talk about that and the, what kinds of content you develop as a brand that is um, maybe, you know, marketing a job opportunity? And when I think of that, I think of LinkedIn and I think of, you know, where you would go in these channels to search for work. What does that look like on TikTok? Yeah, great. I this is where I embarrass my entire team and usually do like the TikTok dances and they're like, Rach, stop. <laughs> um, I uh, so uh, what do we do on TikTok? Um, what we're looking to do is let people know what an apprenticeship is. It's an opportunity to earn while you learn, like have no debt, um, and work at the world's best organizations. Um, and so we're just trying to deliver that sort of like some of these core messages on what an apprenticeship is and where they can go to learn more. We actually do at times promote specific opportunities like, you know, jobs in like jobs in New York this week. And we'll do what we call roles of the week. So we'll say these are all the roles like software engineering roles at Amex. Amex actually has digital marketing roles open right now in New York. Uh, sorry, American Express has digital marketing roles open in New York right now. Um, and so we'll we'll also promote that. Um, and I, I think the idea here is like, for young adults like there are trends like work talk um like that's a key one there there are many different trends on like tiktok that directly relate to the search for employment and the development of skills to be successful in employment um and so it's not just about cute dance moves they may th those those messages may be delivered through cute dance moves um but actually you know young adults are learning about all aspects of their lives, um, you know, through TikTok. Our highest ever web traffic by 30% in multiverse's history was last week, and it was generated by an influence on TikTok. One video. Oh. And, and what was it? It was uh, it was someone who, like, the, it's like, oh, I can't believe this is true. This is so incredible. Look at all these amazing marketing roles at American Express in New York. And she was sort of emulating a story, uh, a post we'd done previously showing the New York roles. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, going back to your experience in leadership, can you talk about which experiences best prepared you for the leadership role that you're in today? Ooh. I'd worked at quite fast growing small companies early in my career. And so that gives you a lot of autonomy um, and a lot of experience being the owner and having to work it out, which is super helpful. Um, when I joined LinkedIn, I got a bit of a shock. I like had to write pre-reads and executive summaries and do two by twos. And I'd never worked in consulting. I had no idea what any of this stuff was. Um, and so I'd say the best thing I ever did was going to a large organization to understand how to do structured communication, how to work with a large number of stakeholders to get to great decisions. Um, and so I think the combination of small, fast growing companies and I mean, LinkedIn was a very fast growing company too, but large, large organizations uh, is what today allows me to sort of oscillate between this is where multiverse is. I, I can see where we're going to be several years from now. Um, and I, we can build with that North Star in mind. But we also know that, you know, we're a serious company, right? Like, you know, I, we, we also have the team size that we have today and the budgets that we have today. And so we need to work out how to step ladder our way up there. I think by having been at small companies where I know how to get things done with limited resource and knowing where, where we'll get to eventually, I can kind of, I know the little steps we need. I know what that step ladder looks like. That makes sense. And you have both sides of the coin because you were at the small companies and then obviously the experience at the large companies. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. So with that in mind, what is top of mind for you as you think about supporting and engaging today's consumers? Mm. I, I, I was thinking about this actually. Um, I, I, I mean, I think this is true. So we, I've, owned, I've worked, my last three jobs have been at marketplace businesses. So they do B2B and B2C and you sort of span those two sides. Um, I think what I've noticed in my career is that as someone who's had the chance to work at marketplace businesses with, you know, CXOs and 16 year olds, uh, that there's not as much difference between those two audiences as we make out. Everyone wants to be, understand the value that's in it for them. Um, and everyone wants to be spoken to in a language that resonates with them. Um, mm -hmm. And for a CEO, yeah, that's different than an 18 year old. 
but the approach and the framework that you execute to be successful in that is the same. Um, and so when I think about that, I think, you know, if our most common medium is a 16 second video, we better have on TikTok, we better have a pretty straightforward resonant message um, that can be communicated quickly. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So then how are you personalizing the consumer experience as you partner, um, you know, from the start with, say, uh, a partner who's the CEO of American Express to um, an 18 year old who's starting their career and trying to take it further? How do you create the different language? Yeah, um, I mean, I'd say every CEO we speak to cares about two things right now. They care about uh, having organizations that represent the communities they serve, right? They care about equitable access to opportunity. That's something every CEO deeply cares about. And they also care about their skill gaps. They know they have technical skill gaps and they have durable skill gaps, durable sometimes called soft skills. We don't call it that, but in case anyone on the call doesn't know. Um, and, and so when we speak to CEOs, we speak about those two problems because apprenticeships are a solution to those two problems. And, and so that's how we frame. And then we speak to a young adult, like their problem is, you know, incredible potential, no idea how to apply it because some of the opportunities that they deserve aren't accessible to them. Um, and so the core message there is this is for you. Like people will opt out of our apprenticeships because they, they can't believe that they are qualified. And, and so our core message there is like, you know, this is like, you know, th this is an opportunity for you. Um, and this will allow you to develop your durable and technical skills and, you know, work at an organization that deeply cares about transforming, um, you know, the demographics um, and, and the equity of the individuals at that organization. Mm -hmm. um, and so both are being told the same message. It's, there's no dissonance between it, um, uh, but it's, it's just led, in a, it led with a different starting point. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Can you talk about what's been the most successful um, campaign or strategy that you've led in the last year? Yeah, um, I feel like I already did a spoiler on this one, which is that it was uh, for B2C, it's definitely TikTok um, and the sort of highest ever web traffic from that. Uh, for B2B, actually, it's, um, you know, obviously account based marketing and all of those things are the bedrock of what we do and, and partnering deeply with our sales team to make sure that, you know, every uh, prospect that's on their list is also on marketing's list. Um, but I think the standout thing for me has been the return to in-person events. Um, mm -hmm. People are really excited to reconnect with their peers um, and have an opportunity to come together um, and picking a few key moments um, to do that um, uh, has been like, you know, a great generator of uh, leads, but also um, a great opportunity to remind like get in person time for us with our potential customers to understand what's top of mind and and reconnect personally um and and for them to like get a sense of what their where their industry is and what their peers are doing you know they, they it feels like people have sort of lost touch a little bit with, with those communities over the last several years definitely i know brand innovators we've started doing the in-person stuff and it's just been like wonderful people are so happy to get back out there and yeah. see each other in person I mean, me too. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Let me out. <laughs> yes. Although, I mean, of course, we've found the benefit of this and doing these live casts and like it's not going to go away, but it's this balance now. Of both. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm here in our office today and I couldn't be more glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are multiverse's challenges and are there um, with redefining the category of apprenticeship? Yeah. I mean, university has been around or college has been around for hundreds of years. <laughs> You know, they've had a lot of time to build their brands. And, you know, we all see those sweaters with, uh, you know, the university emblems like braised on the front. Um, and we really think about how um, multiverse is going to be the logo of choice. We think mm -hmm. about how uh, to build a brand equity around ourselves as an aspirational choice um, versus a uh, college or university. Um, and so when I think about category building, I think there's two jobs to do. One is, you know, what is an apprenticeship, you know, um, and how do we build a consistent understanding and awareness of what that is? Um, 
I, I can't wait until a friend, family member, mentor, guidance counselor, you know, will recommend an apprenticeship, you know, in, in, in your, in a careers guidance, guidance session. Um, and, and then when I think about multiverse specifically, I think, oh, how, how does, how does that become, uh, yeah, how does that become a, a logo that is also considered aspirational? And we're seeing that change. I mean, in the UK, absolutely. Um, and I think it's now just how do we build on that success in the US, UK and here in the US. Why do you think um, multiverse is growing and why is there such a huge problem that needs solving? Yeah, I mean, in the UK, like there's 500,000 additional workers needed this year um, to fill jobs in the digital sector, um, which is three times the number of computer science graduates. And so there's just a real, like there's just a hard skill mismatch there right now. Um, and in the US actually, uh, if one large, one large tech organization shared with us, if they hired every single computer science graduate in the US it, this year, they still would have open roles. And so from a pure skill gap issue, there has to be an alternative to you know, college or university. And like at the same time, you know, 3.4% of individuals in the UK who claim free school meals make it to a top university, 3.4%. And in the US, Black and Hispanic Americans are disproportionately excluded from jobs that require degrees. And so there has never been, you know, when we think about the skill gap, when we think about building organizations that represent the communities they serve, like there has never been a more acute time to address those. And we're hearing that from CEOs. And so I think the acknowledgement that what we've done can't be what we keep doing um, is universal. And I think that is what has powered multiverse's growth over the past several years. That makes sense. How, um, how are you addressing the, um, for the people who are coming in, say from Stanford and then somebody who's coming in from multiverse, how are companies ensuring that there is this equality and the same value placed on this talent as they enter the companies and you know, work together? Great question. The last thing that we would ever want is for someone to be othered because they're an apprentice, right? Like that <laughs> is absolutely not the spirit of what we do or the spirit of any organization we work with. We're seeing, um, you know, in the UK, apprenticeships are now a part of most major organizations' strategy for early talent. Um, you know, companies have apprenticeship departments, uh, you know, who are cons sort of just like you would be for fresh graduates. And so that's, that's a big part of how they think about generating access to opportunity and, and developing opportunities for individuals. And we're starting to see that in the US too. I know at LinkedIn, um, we have an apprenticeship you know, team, apprenticeship program managers, um, and they have apprenticeship programs in place that they run internally. Um, and we're seeing that at other leading organizations in the US too. Um, and so we're beginning to partner with these organizations who have apprenticeship programs internally to work out how, you know, we can, how Multiverse can also run alongside those programs um, and replace or potentially like assist and replace those programs. Um, and then for organizations who haven't quite got to that point yet, where they feel like they can run apprentice programs themselves, obviously we can do that for them. Um, and so I think to your original question, how do we make sure someone isn't othered um, as an apprentice? The goal here is to make apprentices the, you know, just one of the key parts into an organization. It is not othering because it's it, it it's a large it, it's a large group of people. It's considered uh, it, it's considered a producer of excellent individuals, and those individuals are still there progressing throughout the organization and mentoring and sponsoring new incoming apprentices. That makes a lot of sense. Excellent. So, just my last question for you would then be: What do you think is the future of work? Oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do I think is the future of work? You know, work seen a lot of changes over the last several years, which we all know about. So I'm not going to bore us by going on uh, uh, discussing those. They're like, we really have, you know, when we think about a potential economic downturn they're about to experience, there will be a lot of pressures on margins at organizations. Um, and those pressures on margins will translate to how can we automate this? And how can we automate this will translate to how can we use 
like data and engineering skills to automate. And so it will only further, you know, it will only further sort of exacerbate and accelerate that skill gap. Um, and so I think that is going to be something that will continue over the next several years. Um, and then I think retention, right? We, we've seen this over the last several years. It's, it's been incredibly challenging for organizations to attract and retain talent. I'm not sure how that's gonna change in this coming year. But what I do know is every CEO now recognizes that their competitive differentiation is people. Um, and whether you're in a downturn or not, you know that having the best people at your organization is what will stand you, at, stand you apart. And so I, I think there's never been more commitment to attracting high potential individuals and developing them. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the future of work space, you know, how to offer better benefits, how to uh, understand attrition like risks, you know, all of this, you know, software and programs and services around future of work it is really uh, how can we make sure the thing that's of most value to our business people um, are understood. No. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. This has been really insightful. I love talking and we're so happy to have had you. I hope to have you back again. Yeah, great to meet you, Diana. Um, thank you so much.